this is a great opportunity that I love to be able to ask some questions, not answer them, um, and to be able to do this with somebody who's really an extraordinary patriot. And we hear that word a lot, but I think if you pause and think about what patriotism is and what a patriot is about, it's about, from the beginning of this country, people who will take risks, sacrifices in their own life to give back to the greater idea of this nation. Not the country, but a nation, a group of people, not just laws and institutions and boundaries. And I think Susan Rice is perhaps one of the greatest embodiments, not just in this moment in time, but throughout the chapters of American history, who has been that. And somebody who long ago kind of touched my life and moved it in a different direction, um, and somebody who I know wherever she has gone, whether representing this country or whether it is um, the way that she's been able to influence domestically the chapters that are being written today, you've had a huge imprint. We're so excited to have you in the City of Angels. So Thank welcome. you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. First thing, let's, first things first, this is now number sixth on the New York Times bestseller list, but after really? tonight it should be number five or four. So raise your hand if you've bought the book. All right. Keep it up if you've read it. Come on. Okay, good. So a lot of people bought it, and, and, and now raise your hand if you have not bought the book yet. Okay, good. All right. Because afterwards, they're for sale. this will be outside. And those of you who have, and I, and I mean this sincerely too, uh, I, I love reading memoirs and people's books. This is one of the best I've ever read. It is literally about seven books in one, and it's done in such a personal voice. So let's jump into the person, Susan Rice. Tell us with the title, what is tough love as you define it, and how does America need it right now? <laughs> <laughs> tough love, in my estimation, is loving fiercely, but not uncritically. And that's how my parents raised me. Uh, that's how I've tried to, with my husband, raise our kids. It's how I tried to lead my teams in government. And it's also how I've tried to serve the country. And, and in practical terms, what that means is, you know, when you care deeply about somebody or something, being willing to tell them the truth, the hard truth, uh, being able to give and receive constructive criticism when, as my father used to say, it comes from somebody who has your best interests at heart. Mm. And so uh, what this country needs now, you know, let me just back up and say, <laughs> Donald Trump stole the term tough love today. Did he? He tweeted about it. You know, when you get a and, bestseller, they, he steals and, material yeah, wherever he can. I'm telling you. Did he really? What he did. He stole it. In what context? Uh, in a public statement he made. He was congratulating himself about the... <laughs> so-called deal that he struck with the Turks, yeah. he where he be, basically sold out the right. Kurdish homeland right. and called it to. a great deal. Uh, but he said, you know, the Turks needed tough love, and I gave it to them, and without me, this never would have happened, and blah, blah, blah. That's not tough love. Selling out your partners, uh, throwing them under the bus when they fight for you, uh, and fight for all of us to defeat a real terrorist menace. That's not tough love. But um, having your parents tell you, but how much they adore you and how proud they are, but you got to do this, you got to do that, and you're screwing up here, and you're, mm -hmm. that, that's what I call tough love. And for, for our country, Mr. Mayor, we need all of us to demand more. You know, we need leaders who are prepared to serve our collective interest, mm -hmm. our shared interest. And, and in, you know, at the federal level, mm -hmm. at least where I come from in D.C., we had some homework to do to get that right. Mm -hmm. We certainly do. So you speak so beautifully about both the family that raised you and the family that you are raising. So I'm going to jump. I'm not going to do this interview chronologically. Um, but you talk about conversations you have with your son, who has different political philosophies from you, different approach. Um, you, you, said it, you write it so beautifully as a mother, but also made clear that you guys don't always see eye to eye. And it made me think in that chapter when you're talking about how we talk to each other, how do we teach talking to each other in this moment when it is about the tweet, when it is about the hate, when it is about social media and the comments that are like a bathroom wall? How do we educate each other in the way that you were brought up to learn how to talk, to agree and to disagree, and to still be part of this same nation? Well. The mayor's referring to my 22-year-old son, who's a college senior, mm -hmm. and uh, a very uh, committed, passionate, mm -hmm. 
traditional conservative, mm -hmm. uh, who until recently was the president of Stanford College Republicans. <laughs> and we have a daughter who's almost 17, who's very, very progressive. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I are sort of, you know, sitting in the middle at the dinner table trying to keep the food from flying, <laughs> which it does. And uh, the, the answer is, I think, and there's obviously no perfect answer to this, is we have to recognize that at the end of the day, we're all human beings with fears, mm -hmm. with aspirations, with hopes. And if we don't try to listen to one another and understand what motivates each other um, and hear each other out, mm -hmm. um, we're going to be in deep trouble, not just in our own families, uh, where we've resolved that we're going to stay a loving, unitary family. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean we're not going to have arguments and it's not going to get you know, uh, high octane at times, mm -hmm. but we, had to, we really view this as a choice. We're either going to hang together, love each other, and respect each other, or we're going to fall apart. And we don't want to fall apart. And I think we need that same kind of commitment when it comes to our national challenges. I write in the book my very strong view that our domestic political divisions are actually the greatest national security vulnerability we have at the moment. Not only because we're in, unable to get anything of import done, uh, even basic stuff like repairing our infrastructure, mm -hmm. not to mention investing in the kinds of technologies that we need to invest in to be competitive in the decades to come with countries like China. Mm -hmm. But because these divisions are almost like a flesh-eating disease, they're eating us from within. And then we have adversaries like Russia pouring salt in the wounds, making sure that our levels of trust and confidence in our democratic institutions are eroding by the day. So we've got to repair that, and we've got to do it at many different levels. So there's the individual level of you know, discourse and civil respect and you know, learning in schools what our values are, what, our, what, what civics really are. What does our Constitution really say? You know, I'll, to, do, to give you an example, Stanford, my alma mater, where my son is now, and a place I love very much, um, my son texted me today to tell me that the Stanford College Republicans had a table out in White Plaza, which is sort of center part of campus where people are driving on their bike, riding on their bikes or walking past all the time. And a, some student rode by and lobbed a big rock right at the table. Fortunately, didn't hit anybody and rode off and, you know, not found. Now, this happens on the left and the right, these attacks on one another because they want to prevent people from expressing their views. We can't tolerate that. We can't become inured to the notion that we're not allowed to hear views from which we differ. So I, I hope this is a theme we can continue yeah, on, absolutely. but I think it's vital. Well, let me rewind the clock back in your life again, and then I'm going to kind of try to do a third, 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 third from early days, a, th a third in your many chapters about the many places in the world that you've impacted and had, and then a third kind of on the forward-looking observations. But what you talk about a little bit, as I heard you speak, is about belonging. You know, we, we, there's a lot of words we talk about with pluralism, diversity, inclusion. I don't like those as much as the sense of belonging. It's certainly something I've tried to promote as a mayor. is like, how can you make sure that we build a city or a nation where everybody belongs? But we also have senses of belonging as individuals. And I wonder if you could talk about growing up and then in some of the early stages of your career before you, uh, you know, we're at the most senior levels. When did you feel most like you belonged? And when are those moments in your life when you felt like you haven't belonged? I think I feel where I feel I most belong is at, in the place I was born and raised, which was Washington, D.C. Not the political Washington, but the real Washington, where uh, you know it has been most of my life a majority African American city, um, changing demographically now. Um, I was born and raised in uh, 1964 in Washington. Grew up in an environment where um, all of the issues of the day were playing out 
before my eyes as a child from uh, the riots after Dr. King was assassinated and the core of the city burnt down uh, to Vietnam, to Watergate, where the kids of... I went to school with the kids of people who were sent to jail for Watergate. Um, and all of the issues of the day played out in a very personal and tangible way uh, as I was growing up. And I grew up in an environment where, uh, even though I lived in a predominantly African-American, basically half African-American, half Jewish neighborhood in Upper Northwest in Washington, D.C., I went to um, private schools in Washington, private girls' school, and where I was one of mm -hmm. a handful of African-American girls in my class. Um, and, but I still felt I belonged, even though I was mm -hmm. um, a, a minority, mm -hmm. because it was an environment that I'd been in from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but Washington is still home, and so when I, um, when I left for the only time, which was when I went to university and then to graduate school in Oxford and worked for a few years in Toronto, and I've been back ever since, it really is the place that um, I feel tied to. Where I didn't feel I belonged mm. is the place we both went to graduate school uh, in England at Oxford, mm. where, again, I had a wonderful experience academically and made great friends. Detail that, because in here you talk about how few, you were at New College, the system at Oxford is your residential colleges, and at New College you were the only person. Black person of color. The only person of color, Of period. any color. It, in a college of 500. And this is in the late 1980s, and um, England is still, you know, it's Thatcher's England. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, coal miner strikes and, you know, mm -hmm still pretty um, evolving, not entirely modern society. Mm -hmm. You came a little bit after yeah. me. Yeah, food hadn't improved much. But. No, food was terrible. <laughs> but the racism in the UK at the time was of a sort that I had not experienced in the United States. Um, and, you know, so stuff like I would, I would, arrived at this college, New College is one of the larger and more uh, prestigious of the Oxford colleges. There are about 30 of them that comprise the university. And for the first several months that I was there, the people who administered the college, who you know, provided you your mail or cleaned your rooms or you know, acknowledged that you were allowed to enter the college, treated me like I didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't give me my mail. They wouldn't let me charge on, you know, mm -hmm. on credit. Mm -hmm. Uh, all the things that you're supposed to be allowed to do, they, I didn't exist to them. And I couldn't figure it out. It was the weirdest thing. And I was, you know, is it because I'm black? Is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm American? All of those things could be issues in Oxford. And finally I realized the only way, and this was so counterintuitive and so uncomfortable to me, mm -hmm. the only way I could get them to treat me as if I belong there was to speak in their language, which was really one of class, mm -hmm. more than race or anything else. And so finally, it occurred to me that I had to say in effect to them, you know, I'm Susan Rice, I'm a member of this college, your job is to serve and support me, mm -hmm. and I will appreciate it if you would do so from now on, mm -hmm. which was such an obnoxious, you know, <laughs> bitchy thing to say. <laughs> But I had to say it. And right. after that, after mm -hmm. I asserted my, mm -hmm. you know, Place. stature, mm -hmm. everything was fine in that context. I mean, outside of the university, other things happened. I had bus drivers slap me and stuff like that. But, mm. you know, things that, you know, <laughs> people wouldn't get away with here. So, so, so fast forward, you write in here about times when the Susan Rice, who's now assistant secretary, or you an ambassador is suddenly thrust into a room, sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. Let's take the Eritrean Ethiopian conflict. Yeah. And you're there with the president of Eritrea. I'm sure there's much more detail than the two sentences where you said that President Isaiah was, I forget what was, condescending. Challenging and my manhood. Challenging, and yeah, challenging your manhood. <laughs> um, what does it feel like that Susan Rice, remembering back those moments, and how you navigate that, often being the only woman in a room, being the first African American in places, um, or just being a human being that, you know, the whole imposter syndrome, the dirty little secret is we all have it, right? Every day. Just some are more trained to 
think that way more often than others. Um, what gives you the strength that you describe in here to always just, it seems like Susan Rice is ready. She's ready for a fight. She's ready to stand up for herself. She's ready to assert that. But not, not for the sake of doing it, but to make sure you can get to the work that you have to do. Yeah, I'm not looking to start a fight, but if somebody brings it, I got to be ready. Mm -hmm. um, I think the answer, Mr. Mayor, is it really came from my parents. Mm -hmm. um, let me tell you a little bit about them. My Please. dad was born in segregated South Carolina around 1920 into the worst and most you know, raw manifestations of Jim Crow. And that was his cauldron. Uh, he was drafted into the Air Force in World War II and served at Tuskegee with the Tuskegee Airmen. And many people look at the Tuskegee Airmen and say, well, you know, what a wonderful mm -hmm. you know, example of African-American history. My father looked at that at the time and throughout his life subsequently and resented mightily the notion that African Americans were expected to prove to white people that they could fly aircraft or that they could perform as well as anybody else. And he resented that he was serving in a, in a military that was fighting for freedom on behalf of everybody except for his own people. And he would go to try to eat in restaurants off base and be refused the ability to do so and see German POWs being served. So that was his experience. And yet, after the war, he came to California where you know, he found really psychological liberation. He got his PhD in economics at Berkeley. He became a professor at Cornell. He served in the World Bank and the Treasury Department. And ultimately, he was a governor of the Federal Reserve. And Despite all of those experiences, my father loved this country to death. Mm -hmm. He was a fierce patriot. But what he realized along the way that enabled him to see how great this country was and is, despite his personal experience, uh, and was that he somehow figured out that he couldn't let racism be his burden. Mm -hmm. So he, I quote him in the book. He says, if my being black is going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for somebody else, mm -hmm. not for me. And so what he trained himself to do over the years, and it's really hard, but he also tried to teach me and my brother this, is a sort of psychological jujitsu to realize that prejudice really comes from somebody else's insecurity. Mm -hmm. And if you let their insecurity become your insecurity, if you let it get in your head and allow you to question your own capacity or your own self-worth, then the bigot is won and you're defeated and you know your ability to accomplish is vastly diminished. So he had a whole complex psychology around how to deal with racism and other forms of prejudice. And that's what he taught me and my brother. Mm -hmm. He taught us that we had to believe in ourselves. We had the capacity to do what we set out to do. Yes, we were going to encounter a Obstacles, yes, we're going to encounter racism and sexism and all of that. And we had to take no crap off of anybody. This was his mantra, don't take crap off anybody, which is maybe why I'm, <laughs> when somebody pulls a knife, I'm, you know, I'm ready. Right. But figuratively. <laughs> uh, but, you know, his whole thing was you've got to stand up for yourself mm -hmm. and believe in yourself. So in a room where I was often the only and often the youngest and the, you know, the woman, the African-American, the whatever it is, I didn't really spend a lot of time psychologically mm -hmm. freaking out about the fact that I was the only. I was conscious of it, but my view of it was, okay, that's, this is the situation, but here's what I'm here to get done. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work to get it done. And if somebody else, if an African head of state is going to balk at the fact that they're talking to a 33-year-old assistant secretary mm -hmm. who's a breastfeeding mother, mm -hmm. that's their problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't change who I am, so I'm not going to spend a lot of psychological energy worrying about it. That's hard to do, and I, you know, I've tried mm -hmm. to share that uh, philosophy with others, mm -hmm. and including my own kids. Um, but I really do think it served me well. And it's a great gift my dad gave me. Yeah, absolutely. That's a wonderful story. So let's cut to now you're in 
government. You worked on a political campaign. It was the Dukakis Benson campaign. <laughs> Does anybody remember that? Electoral politics. Nineteen eighty-eight. Wasn't for you. I've always said that losing campaigns. I, I worked. It's funny. You took time off of Oxford to work on that campaign. I took time off from Oxford to work on Kathleen Brown's campaign, where we took a fifteen-point lead and lost by fifteen points. And I and I always say, winning campaigns. Everybody fights because there's spoils, but when you lose, you actually stay in touch with everybody because there's no spoils to divide. But you decided electoral politics at that point, which had been your dream to become senator to run, is not where you want to make an impact. You decide it's going to be policy. And you come into the Clinton administration, later into the Obama administration. Talk about those two administrations. How do they compare to each other? And you had very different roles in them. One, you were much closer to the principal, but you got a sense of culture, of organization, of people. And obviously, the times are always different, too. But give us a sense of how those two administrations compared. Well, interestingly, you, and you'll understand this, there were a lot of the same people. Mm -hmm. you know, but by the time we got to the Obama administration, some of the, those of us who were young in the Clinton administration <laughs> were you know, uh, Still young more in the senior. Obama administration. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I, it is important to, to say that I was serving at different levels, and I, I don't have, it's sort of a little bit apples and oranges for me to make a comparison. Um, I do think that in the Obama administration, the notion of no drama was the theory of the day. I can't say that was quite the same <laughs> in the Clinton administration. <laughs> um, what they, what the two, what they had in common, however, was great intellectual capacity mm -hmm. uh, and great rigor. And uh, while, you know, President Clinton was more garrulous and would, you know, meeting could go on a long time and you know lots of stories and you know late night phone calls and you know all that kind of stuff, he had a razor sharp mind. And so, of course, did President Obama, and that trickles down into how meetings are run and decisions are made. Um, I enjoyed working for both presidents very much, but I obviously had a much closer uh, perspective in the Obama administration, serving in the cabinet when I was UN ambassador, and then of course being in the White House every day as national security advisor. Uh, so I got to see President Obama, um, you know, rocking in the in the beast in the limousine to mm -hmm. his you know his music when we were on foreign <laughs> trips and singing you know while I was in my pocket you know <laughs> I didn't get that so much uh, with President Clinton um, although he was a lot of fun too yeah. but you know they were they were it was a great privilege to be able to serve in both mm -hmm. and you know what I learned in the Clinton administration from a, the capacity of growing personally mm -hmm. and learning how to manage teams and, and you know the mistake learning from the mistakes I made mm -hmm. as a young assistant secretary and then being able to to draw on that learning to to hopefully do better in the Obama administration was also well, what were some of the lessons give, give us an example of something you learned from something that happened to you during the Clinton administration that then on the ground in a scenario in the Obama administration was helpful well I think the biggest learning I did in the Clinton administration was at this time when I'm 32 years old. I'm named Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, meaning I'm running a bureau of 100 people, 5,000 altogether when you count all the personnel in our embassies in 43 countries in Africa. And I just had a baby, so I am, you know, not only a young uh, woman of African American background, but I'm a breastfeeding mother in a culture where uh, it's still quite conservative and pinstripe, small c conservative. And my son learned to walk in the halls of the State Department, uh, which was very disconcerting to many of the <laughs> senior foreign service officers. And, uh, and most of the senior people who reported to me were 20 to 30 years my uh, elders and had much more um, real professional experience working on Africa. And I had knowledge, I had the backing of the secretary, I had worked on African affairs at, at a senior level at the White House, but I basically you know, was in a position where I had to prove myself. Mm -hmm. And I was young and I was hard charging and I was determined to get stuff done and I was impatient. And in 1998, my first full year on the job, we had all kinds of stuff hit the fan. Yep. The 
outbreak of war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, war in the Congo, war resuming in, in the Sudans and Angola, and then most terrifically for, us, for those of us in Washington and in the State Department, we lost our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania to terrorist attacks by Al-Qaeda in 1998. So we were under an extraordinary amount of pressure, and I was you know, driving the team as hard as possible. And uh, one day towards the end of the year, uh, a colleague took me out to lunch at a really crappy Chinese restaurant near the State Department. And he sat me down and he said, you're going to fail. You, your leadership style is not working. You're really smart. You've got good policy ideas. You've got good motivations, but you're mismanaging people. And you're not valuing their inputs and perspectives. You're not taking their, um, taking their expertise on board. And I want to see you succeed, but here's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. And it was the most powerful example of professional tough love that I've been given. Mm. And I think without that, I would have driven off a cliff. Mm. Um, and he was kind enough to tell me what I needed to know mm -hmm. from the vantage point of somebody who had my best interests at heart and abled, enabled me to correct course so that I learned a, a more constructive, inclusive, supportive leadership style that served me well when I then came back to run the US mission to the United Nations and to run the staff of the National Security Council. There's so many places in your book that I'm almost wary of jumping in because North Korea, Cuba, Syria, Libya, Africa, um, I mean, you, you talk about all of them in here. And, you, and this is really a great primer for anybody who just wants to understand foreign relations and foreign policy in the United States. But of those places, which ones today stick out the most? The ones where you, you feel, we all know that we're part of huge and amazing teams and we're just one piece of that, but where you feel what you advocated for, what you negotiated, what you were able to personally kind of put in there might have been a piece of that defining difference of something successful. And I think most movingly, you talk about just the debate back and forth. And because it's so present right now, maybe you could describe a little bit in the Obama administration, the debates around Syria and the role you played. But first, you know, tell us a place where you felt you know, Susan Rice made, made a difference. And it was um, one of the kind of great foreign policy victories we were able to achieve. Well, I describe in the book the role of the National Security Advisor as being like a point guard on a basketball team meaning that you set up the plays, you lead the team, but you're not the star, usually, unless you're, you know, Michael. You know <laughs> Steph Curry or something. <laughs> uh, you, you are the person who's supposed to see the entire field and uh, call the plays, pass the ball. And so as National Security Advisor, you chair the cabinet-level principals committee that meets frequently on these most difficult issues. And you're making sure that the, you know, the Secretary of State who may be out negotiating has what he needs, has the guidance from the President, has the policy parameters to make sure that he's tracking on course or that the Secretary of Defense knows what the President's guidance is and you know, that the tough issues when the agencies differ amongst themselves have been worked through and resolved. So that's really the role of the National Security Advisor. And so on many of the issues in the Obama administration where we tried to, to affect some kind of meaningful change, whether it was the opening to Cuba after so many years of mm -hmm. um, sclerosis, um, or working to negotiate the Paris Climate Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, which was something that we had to start with in a bilateral fashion with the Chinese, which was complicated at the time, and then um, broaden the coalition to achieve that agreement. Or the Iran nuclear deal, which was extremely complex uh, and um, painstaking to negotiate. Those are all areas where I felt that the, the role that I played in facilitating the team um, to, to achieve a goal together mm -hmm. were important. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, we've seen how uh, President Obama's successor has approached some of those same issues. Um, but I still think that, you know, we were able to do something 
if there were a theme that unites the Obama administration's approach to international affairs, it was to try to bring our allies and partners together around collective solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did in each of the instances that I named. That's how we got 65 or more countries to join us in the fight against ISIS. Um, that's how we contained the Ebola epidemic, uh, which arose in 2014. And we rallied the international community to put in resources along with our own to help staunch what could have been a much greater tragedy. That's how we imposed uh, sanctions with Europe and, and others that punished Russia for its intervention in Ukraine. But bringing allies and partners to bear to deal with these tough challenges is what we have to do. And it's, you know, it, it's what I'm afraid we're lacking today. Um, because, you know, despite what you may hear, international relations, national security is not a zero sum proposition. It's not the case that what is good for us has to be bad for somebody else. Or that if it's good for America, it, it's, you know, bad for somebody else, America first. That's not how the world works. Not if you want to get stuff done. Not if you want to advance the security and the well-being of the American people. Uh, it, we don't live in a world where we can pretend that the only things that matter are those things that happen within our borders or that which we can directly control. It's not that simple. Well, move, moving to, to Syria and, and some of the other places where you've um, had such a deep volume of work has often been around these really, really tough decisions where oftentimes you being the one to push, let's do something, may be the right thing at that moment. It may later not be followed up with the nation building or the other pieces that you need. Um, it was interesting trying to figure out what's the Rice Doctrine here because you're a very pragmatic person and, and I think you shown here it's not about one singular philosophy of always intervene or don't. These things are really complicated. Syria, you say, is perhaps the most complicated thing the Obama administration dealt with. And now we see people again fighting and dying on the news today. Walk us through what that was like on the inside. And today, how you look at that landscape and, and how that informs, you know, what is American foreign policy supposed to be about at the end? In moments like this, if you were there today, and you were the president, or you were the secretary of state, or you were advising this president, what would you be saying we need to be doing to try to be Americans and try to stand for American values in a place as complicated as that? Well, there's a theme that runs throughout the book because it's a theme that runs throughout my uh, years of service. And it's the question of when and how, or whether and how, mm. to intervene in humanitarian crises. And I begin the book at the early stages, the, the policy portion of the book, at the early stages of my tenure uh, in the Clinton administration when I was working on UN issues. And I talk about how we wrestled with Somalia uh, after Black Hawk Down, and then how we subsequently um, dealt with the Rwanda, or failed to deal with the Rwandan genocide in 1994. These were issues that I was observing and, and participating in on the margins as a very junior staffer then at the NSC. But what I saw and what I learned from those experiences informed my thinking and judgments as I became a much more senior policymaker. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the problem, the, the mistake we made in Somalia, in my judgment, among many, but the, the principal mistake was that we had US forces deployed in a combat zone and we didn't have a sufficient understanding of the complexities of the politics in the society. And senior leadership, this cabinet level principles committee that I described that I later chaired, really wasn't engaged on a hands-on basis on the issues as they evolved and got more complex. They left that, those decisions were left to, to the deputies and more junior people. So when Black Hawk Down occurred, senior people were caught flat-footed. Mm -hmm. So being hands-on and engaged when you have US forces deployed was that lesson. Then moved to, to Rwanda. What Rwanda was a searing experience for all of us who lived through it. And I traveled there six months after the genocide. And I write in the book about how unbelievably emotionally devastating that was to be walking literally over corpses that were still thick on the ground. But the the mistake we made, I believe, in Rwanda was that we never actually 
dealt with the question of should we intervene or not. We were so stunned and reeling after Somalia that neither in the administration nor Congress nor on the editorial pages was there ever a serious consideration of what could the United States or should the United States do. We just didn't have that discussion. Mm -hmm. And so that was the policy lesson I took from there. You got to actually engage the question. And if you decide not to, that's one thing, but you got to decide. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to Libya and Syria, which were the sort of seminal examples of that in the Obama administration. I was UN ambassador when we were dealing with Libya, and I advocated for the United States to get involved with NATO, with the Arab countries, to protect civilians through the use of air power mm -hmm. uh, in Libya. And we did that. But that's the president. The president made that decision. I got the resolution passed at the UN. And then, and I still believe that was the right thing to do. But then we failed in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. We didn't, we, the United States, the international community, the UN, NATO, we did not invest enough effort and attention in trying to help Libya, which was a fractured society, begin to cohere and establish institutions. And then we had the tragedy uh, of the terrorist attack in Benghazi, and Washington you know, was revolted and turned away. And I say on Libya that I don't know for sure that had we put all of our effort and attention as we, we might have and should have, that we could have made a meaningful difference. Mm -hmm. Because it was a fractured society that was so um, difficult to reconstitute. But we didn't test that. Mm -hmm. So that was our sin there. And then moved to Syria. And this, as I said, most complex of all the issues. Um, and we wrestled every week, almost, with the question of how much more involved should the United States get in the Syrian civil war. So we didn't commit the error of Somalia or Rwanda in not mm -hmm. uh, tackling the decision at senior levels. But the president, who I think agonized over that issue more than any other, mm -hmm. and is different from what we're dealing with now, which is the fight against ISIS, which he led us into, mm -hmm. And it's different from the question on one level of the chemical weapons red line. But should the United States have been more involved to in, militarily in an effort to topple Assad mm -hmm. and support the opposition before the Russians intervened? That was the hard policy question. Um, and President Obama made the decision that, uh, given the balance of our interests, mm -hmm. that we should not get more deeply militarily involved on behalf of the opposition in Syria. And Nobody who worked those issues, and certainly not I, feel good about that decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, the humanitarian and strategic costs of what happened in Syria mm -hmm. are enormous. I still happen to think that on balance it was the right judgment, mm -hmm. as painful as that is. So where does that leave you on the yeah. big question of whether and when to intervene? My answer is, and so I don't know that mm -hmm. the Rice Doctrine is there is no doctrine. Mm -hmm. The Rice Doctrine is that we have to look at each situation carefully and deliberately on its merits. Mm -hmm. And we have to weigh the risks and the costs of intervention to our interests and our values against the benefits of intervention. And the answer is not going to be the same in every context. Mm -hmm. President Obama said when he announced our intervention in Libya, just because we can't intervene everywhere doesn't mean we shouldn't intervene anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. Mm -hmm. But we have to do a very careful cost-benefit analysis, and we have to realize that it's not you know, just the action of the intervention. It's the aftermath, mm -hmm. which can often be the hardest part. So there's four minutes before we get to the audience questions, so I'm going to do some kind of lightning round stuff. So uh -oh. ask you for short answers. I'll try to give short questions as well. Of all the foreign leaders that you have interacted with, who have you enjoyed the most? And do you keep in touch with any of them? Uh, the one that I enjoyed the most mm -hmm. is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. That was Shimon Peres. Mm -hmm. uh, and I write about yes. Um, yes. our friendship in the book. He mm -hmm. was amazing. Mm -hmm. And Angela Merkel, I also have mm -hmm. great respect for. Yep. Do, you, do you keep in touch with former heads of state? Is that something that happens when you leave these mm -hmm. jobs a little bit? Yeah, a little a, bit. They kind of pop, when pop they by come Washington, D.C. So have a drink, have some dinner. So that's, um, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think right now, outside, you talk about domestic uh, chaos being a threat to national security. What external threats do you think, top three, 
to the United States there are right now for national security? There are more than three. Okay, go. But Russia, mm -hmm. um, pandemic disease, mm -hmm. and uh, if you're talking about t proximity, I wouldn't count climate change, but if you're talking mm -hmm. about severity, I would. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I also think we have to be concerned about lesser things. I know you want lightning answers. But no, don't we, worry. You know, we got to be worried about what happens between India and Pakistan. I think mm -hmm. we can't take our eye off that mm -hmm. ball. Uh, and I worry that, you know, we could find ourselves embroiled in a conflict in the Gulf mm -hmm. between Saudi Arabia and Iran or its mm -hmm. proxies. Mm -hmm. What did you think about the Nobel Peace Prize this year? Loved it. Uh, did people follow that? The Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Ethiopia? Prime Minister of Ethiopia. Um, he's, he's, Ahmed he's, he's, he's come, he's he? come here before. We have the, one of the largest Ethiopian communities yeah. in the world right here. And, I thought uh, that was in we'll Washington. Back. Yeah, well, you know, we go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. <laughs> 37 countries have their largest population here outside the home country, but you know, I just, I sell LA for a living, so I'm gonna. <laughs> um, I wanna end with a personal question because we have two minutes left. One of the most moving passages in the book is there's a great scene where you are about to read your daughter a bedtime story. And President Obama calls and says, this is a good time to talk. Tell us not only about that scene, but what it was like to balance that. Something, you know, I, before I came here, I say goodbye to my seven-year-old daughter and um, didn't get to tuck her in tonight, but I'm either always home for dinner or, or tuck her in. And I, I stay in the city where I, you know, mostly work. And uh, for you, you need to leave, you need to go places. What, how did you continue to be a great mom and deal with moments like that? What did that feel like? Well, this story um, was when, right after he was elected in 2008, President Obama called me around 8 o'clock at night, President-elect Obama, uh, and said, you know, is this a good time? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, it's fine. I'm reading my daughter a bedtime story. And he goes, no, that's not a good time. Call me back uh, when you're done the father of young children. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was when he offered me the job of UN ambassador uh, on that follow-up phone call, <laughs> which would, of course, mean that I would be separated from my children. <laughs> That's why he wanted one last story years. for mama. And then good, good luck raising yourself. You know? <laughs> so it was really hard to yeah. be apart from my, my kids were eight and 13 when I started at the UN. And my husband was, a, at that point, uh, an executive producer for ABC's Sunday show this week. So his job was in Washington. Our kids were in school in Washington. I didn't know, you know how long I was going to be in New York. So we didn't move the family. And I was commuting back and forth um, on the weekends when I could. And my parents also um, happened to, to get very ill during my time in New York, and my, my father ultimately died when I was ambassador. My mom died later. But balancing all of that was, and I don't even, balancing is the wrong word, managing all of that was really hard. And I could never have done it without my husband, who was just an incredible partner, is an incredible partner mm -hmm. every step of the way. Um, How many copies of your book does he have? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> has has he bought the know. most? He, right. he, he literally read every word of every draft wow. all the way through. That's, that's and low. that's indicative of, yeah. you know, how he rolls. So that he, he was critical. And the other thing was my kids were supportive. Mm. They understood mm. that what I was doing was important. And I tried to bring them up to the UN as often as possible. My son, the conservative, <laughs> uh, that's the next was, book. <laughs> yeah, my son, the concern. Uh, he was such a nerd. He'd sit in these UN meetings for hours on end, just cool. absorbing it. Um, and it could be like the most boring budget meetings you can imagine. He'd just be a sponge in there. And my daughter would come up, and she'd see all this. And they got that it was important and interesting, so they never really gave me a hard time. Yeah. They were partners with me, too. Um, so, you know, I... Everybody's situation is different. I hate to give advice on so-called work-family balance to people or tell them to lean in or not lean in. I'm not, all, I'm not into that. I just think everybody's got to figure it out in their own context what can work. And it's frankly, it never works, right? It's al always out of whack yep. one way or another. Sure. Uh, and part of the challenge is just getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. 
a great place to end our portion. Now we're going to go to your portion. So uh, Ted, I don't know, are you coming up to ask the question? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Garcetti. Um, so we got a lot of questions came in. We'll synthesize them to a few. Um, Ambassador Rice, with your blockbuster bona fides as a valedictorian and a Rhodes Scholar, you could have made a fortune in the private sector. When did you know you'd focus on public service? Well, I still might. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I would focus on public service from the time I was a kid, quite honestly. That was the environment in which I was raised. I knew I cared about the business of governing and making policy. The, the dilemma was, as the mayor said, you know, elected office or, you know, you know working in, in the executive branch, I chose the latter. There was a period when I was wrestling with, you know, domestic policy or foreign policy. I chose the latter. Um, but it was always what I was passionate about. And um, I've never really been that interested in making money, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Just... I don't mind having it. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to have it. Yeah, right. But it just, as a business, it is, is my passion and calling. It hasn't spoken to me yet. But I, there's still time. <laughs> How do we convince more women to run for higher office and enter careers in public service? Well, obviously, they need to see role models uh, doing it and doing it successfully. Um, I, you know, I want to see young people of all sorts uh, commit to careers in, in public service, and women in particular, uh, minorities in particular. Um, you know, I think when somebody like Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. stands up and is the only woman in the room. Yeah. yeah. And speaks truth. Mm. Um, that's that's going to have to, I think, inspire a lot of people. And we all have to do work to encourage young people in general to feel that the the, the business of policy making and of government is relevant to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you must encounter this challenge all the yeah. time. I, I worry that young people are getting so turned off and discouraged that yeah. whether they're women or men, we're not getting the, the, the people with the passion involved. Well, let me insert one quick one, Ted, if I may. You said, you know, after that campaign, you thought uh, the Dukakis campaign, not politics, not electoral politics for you, then policy. But there's a lot of people who are trying to open that door is that a door that you, I know you recently announced that you're not going to run for senator in Maine. And this time. I, this time. Yeah. So with that maybe the answer, uh, is that door something that's still open? And do you look at that, I mean, you knew that you have to have politics to make policy well, right? You had to learn political skills and vice versa to make good policy. Do you believe that maybe we need people to get into politics? Yes, we need good people to get into politics. So will you, um, do you think, in the future? I don't something? know. I mean, the, so the, I looked at the question of running against Susan Collins from Maine, where my mother's family has deep roots and we have a home. And honestly, the bottom line for me was I still have a daughter at home. She's in her junior year in high school. I left my kids for the better part of eight years yeah. between working in New York or working in a job in the White House where if I even was sleeping under the same roof, I wasn't <laughs> as president as I wanted to be. And so I just didn't feel like this was the time mm -hmm. to either uproot her or um, leave her. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go on book tour <laughs> instead. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a principal reason. I still have, I, I keep an open mind yeah, about electoral great. office, about appointed office. Um, but I also feel like, you know, I've been so lucky to serve at the highest levels for presidents that I truly admire. Yeah. The bar's pretty high. Yeah. Well, we hope you keep the door open. Next question. <laughs> um, your brother said, and I'm quoting, uh, that you acted like a girl in Washington um, in the face of criticism. How must, <laughs> how must women behave in Washington to succeed? My wonderful brother is sensitive about that sentence because he... he, he thinks it sounds sexist, and let me make underscore that it does not come from a sexist place at all. What he was saying to me, and this was in the context of our, my trying to learn from my experience mm -hmm. with Benghazi, was and not just with Benghazi and, and you know, being publicly pilloried and how I approached that and how I found myself in that situation, but also he was really talking about uh, the aftermath when I made the decision to withdraw my name from consideration for being Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. And what he was saying is, you know, 
that sometimes you have to be far more forceful in advocating for yourself. And we have an ongoing argument about this. You know, he would point out that guys who uh, have ambitions are, you know, very comfortable putting them out there and, you know, championing themselves. Mm -hmm. And when he said I was acting like a girl, what he meant was, you know, I was always, in his judgment, putting mission, the enterprise, the team first mm -hmm. to my own detriment, whether that was my decision to accept the... Uh, the request to go on the Sunday shows, mm -hmm. or my refusal to try to gin up uh, mm -hmm. public support for my own candidacy for Secretary of State, which is something I would refuse steadfastly to do. Mm -hmm. So that was his message. And then, but the flip side of it is when I do advocate for myself, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to tell a funny story. People are consider that chutzpah. Mm -hmm. So I was on, <laughs> did anybody see Fareed's Sunday show last week? I was on there. First question he asked me was, you know, the one question from the book, same thing you described. You know, so President Obama calls you and he asks you if you want to be UN ambassador. Mm -hmm. And you say that you actually you'd rather be national security advisor. Isn't that extreme chutzpah? And I said, you know what? If a guy had yeah, done that, absolutely. you wouldn't be asking this yep. question. I was more polite than that on television. <laughs> but that's basically what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. So and thankfully, President Obama, you know, expected and demanded the same of women as he did of men and was mm -hmm. not at all put off by that. But there was a case where I did actually say very directly, but in private, mm -hmm. you know, would you consider me for this at this time? And he explained why not and, you know, maybe later. Mm -hmm. But that advocacy is, for myself, is what my brother was suggesting I needed to mm -hmm. be able and willing to do in more public context. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Rice, um, your parents were amazing trailblazers for their generation. Can People you tell have read us? The book. <laughs> can you tell us um, how they met? Yeah, well, I will try to tell you how they met. <laughs> so my parents were wonderful people. I've spoken about my dad. My mother came from Portland, Maine, as I said, the daughter of Jamaican immigrants. Uh, they had nothing. They sent all five of their kids to college. My mother was the youngest. She went to Radcliffe, she ended up being a corporate executive, served on 11 corporate boards, but most importantly, she was instrumental in the establishment of the Pell Grant program. And when she died, she was, her obituaries called her the mother of the Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, 80 million Americans have access to college in part because of what my mom did. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my parents had no business being married. They had a horrible marriage, a terrible breakup, which we didn't talk about, but it was a very scarring experience for me. Uh, and so I know really very little about how they met because they didn't talk about it much. I know they met in New York City uh, around 1962. I believe, according to something my dad said once, that they met at a dinner when he was a staff economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. My mother was working then uh, for the college board. Mm -hmm. And in any case, they'd both been married once before. Mm -hmm. um, they were almost 15 years apart in age. And you know, within a year and a half, two years, they got married. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they got married, they moved to Nigeria, uh, where my father was uh, assigned to help establish the Central Bank of Nigeria. And then I was conceived in Nigeria. They came back to Washington. And that's where I was born and raised. But they just didn't talk about it that much. Mm -hmm. It was such, and, it, and I realized, I didn't really realize until I started to write the book and tried to ask myself that same question that there was a reason I didn't know the answer. <laughs> My brother didn't know the answer. Um, anyway, wonderful people, great parents, bad marriage. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for more, Ted? Uh, a couple more. Okay. Many of us feel desperate about the deep and widening divide here in the U.S. and the seemingly inability for civil dialogue. What is your wisdom about how to handle this, or is it just intractable? It's not intractable. Our domestic political divisions are, by definition, a problem that we have ourselves created. That's the good news, because since we created it, we have the capacity to fix it. Mm -hmm. And we have to go about fixing it, as I started to say early in the conversation, from the individual level to the institutional level to the national level. And at the institutional level, it's, it's important. You know, what do we teach our kids? 
How do we tolerate you know, dissenting voices on campus? How do we um, validate you know, respect for the, the core principles in our Constitution? But I also think at the national level, we've got to have some innovative approaches to the urgent problem we face. And so I'm advocating for serious consideration of mandatory national service for Americans 18 to 22, regardless of their income level, regardless of where they're from, regardless, frankly, of their immigration status. If everybody 18 to 22 or 20, 21 or 22 spent six or 12 months having to work with and cooperate with and live with people who come from vastly different backgrounds and understand who they are and what motivates them, I think we'd be a lot more cohesive as a nation. It's really hard. One thing I learned in Washington, D.C., growing up in the 60s and 70s in a very bipartisan environment was it's really hard to hate people that you mm -hmm. know well. Mm -hmm. And if you know somebody on a human level, even if you disagree with them, mm -hmm. you can find a way forward. The other mm -hmm. thing I want to say on this, you know, how hopeless is the current situation. We've been through so much worse. If you think of the span of our history, mm -hmm. we've been through a civil war, mm -hmm. reconstruction, two world wars, McCarthyism, Vietnam, where students were being shot on campuses. Mm -hmm. The civil rights era, where our cities burnt down and people like me had dogs sicked on them. Mm -hmm. We've been through all of that. And we have come through it still, still unitary mm -hmm. and arguably stronger. Today's challenges, and they're real, and they're deeply disturbing, do not stack up, if you think about it to those, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, rather than feeling despairing and you know, that we aren't in a position to do anything about it, you know, we're all agents. We all have responsibility. We all have capacity if we engage. And, you know, the last part of this book is really a call to, to arms mm -hmm. for standing up and fighting for our democracy and our national unity. Mm -hmm. And I conclude by saying, that nobody's ever won by betting against the United States of America's long-term capacity to grow and heal. Mm -hmm. And that we'd be, they'd be foolish to start now. Mm. And I really believe that. But that depends on all of us seizing this moment. Our final question for the evening. Um, both of you are Rhodes Scholars. Um, I may be mistaken, but I understand um, when Mayor Garcetti applied, you were on the selection the committee. <laughs> All right, that so I true. guess that's our dirty little secret. <laughs> Go on, tell me. Yeah, you tell okay, so, so, yeah, because you only remember when you're on, like, the other end yeah. of stuff. But, yeah, um, I was a student in New York City at Columbia. I had actually applied for a scholarship my senior year, been turned down even for an interview, but a uh, mentor of mine, Carlton Long, who uh, was an um, African-American Rhodes Scholar from a first in his family to go to college, said, you know, when George Stephanopoulos won my year, it was the second time he applied. Just put it in the second year. In the second year, I got uh, chosen to go to the interview. And it's funny, because there's two different things that you have to do. You have to go to a cocktail party the night before your actual interview. And they said, the cocktail party's not important. It's just social time to relax you. Sure, like everybody who's competing is right there <laughs> together. What it's really about is Determining who are the assholes. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, seriously. Right. Yeah, yeah. In retrospect, the, 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 yes. <laughs> the assholes yeah. are the ones that don't let other people talk. Yeah. They're the ones that, you know, are self-promoting. You can learn a lot about how people <laughs> are by how they engage in a cocktail party. Well, so, so at the cocktail party, I was, I was just telling Ambassador Rice this story that, um, you know, everybody in the committee was going up to all the other students and saying the amazing things they had written and done and accomplished. And then she came up to me and said, you're, you're the photographer? And that was, you know, I do take photographs. So please follow me on Instagram, Eric Garcetti. <laughs> but uh, it was, you know, that was not anything to do with my essay. And I was like, oh, I've lost this thing. It's terrible. I went to St. Patrick's Cathedral that night, prayed, had some champagne with my mentor and knew that I'd lost. And the next day in the committee, um, there's three people who passed to the next level. And, and Susan was on the committee. And, uh, and they debrief with you after they pick you. And I was lucky enough to get through. And she gave me great advice moving forward. 
And you know, people touch your lives in ways you never think. We didn't see each other, I think, face to face again to, until Angela Merkel was being honored at the White House, and I was lucky enough to be invited by President Obama to a state dinner, and I got to see you again. And um, yeah, so we we both shared that in common. But I would not literally be here today with at least the life experiences that I've had were it not for Susan Rice. So I'm and so that is grateful. an exaggeration. That. that is. <laughs> Very nice, but no, no, not true. true. You it did is. it yourself. It is. No. Anyway, anyway I, I think I speak for this entire city of angels that we have welcomed this angel to our town, somebody who has done extraordinary work for our country. Thank you all for being here and being a part of this. Do spread the word about this. If you need some salve for your tortured soul, whether it comes to democracy or foreign policy or just the belief in ourselves, this is the book, um, and we want to get it up past number six. We're going to keep buying until it's number one, and we're so grateful thank to you, you Ambassador, you. for thank your you. service, and thank you so much.